In the season of abundance, we're going to be reading from 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 6. Uh, but I made an uh, observation that I want to share with all of you as well, and that is, if you look in your bulletin, in the back it says flowers, Kathy and Toma. And then if you look at the abundance of the table, it's like, wow, this is more than just flowers. So thank you very much. So from the New Testament, as we work together with him, we urge you also not to accept the grace of God in vain. For he says, at an acceptable time, I have listened to you. And on a day of salvation, I have helped you. See, now is the acceptable time. See, now is the day of salvation. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? We are the temple of God, the living God. And as God said, I will live in them and walk among them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Would you pray with me a moment? Gracious God, we we ask you to pour out your spirit, to be among us, to search us, hear us, know us. Help us to be at peace in our own skins so that we can hear the message that you have for us today, and so that we can be your servant people in the world. We pray this prayer believing that you hear it and trusting that nothing can separate us from the love that you revealed in Jesus the Christ, and it's through his name and spirit that we pray and say together, amen. So this is the last installment of the series called Outside My Own Little World. It's, for those of you keeping track, this is number nine in a series. And one of the things that I have found extremely helpful about it are the visuals that Kathy Toma and Nancy McPherson have created to really help us, those of us who are visual learners, to be able to see sometimes feeds us as much as the that comes out of my mouth. Just seeing if you were paying attention. So today, start living right now. And again, comes out of the phrase from the Thread Song. Um, that was the last time we'll sing it for a while, and I'm, I'm really pleased that I could hear a lot of other people besides Owen singing, although Owen does a lovely job with it wherever he is. Oh, he's gone to help the kids with the Christmas pageant rehearsal. So the, the resource for this series has been the Worship Design Studio with Dr. Marsha McPhee and the, the quick summary is that we started with population two, and then I try to stay awake, um, which most of us can relate to on Sunday morning, especially when it's nice and toasty warm like it is here this morning. I don't want to miss what matters. Look me in the eye. What if there's a greater purpose? Give me open hands and open doors. Break my heart for what breaks yours. Dying and living on All Saints Day. Last week, I want to be reaching out. So start living right now. And I want to confess to you that after living with this outside my own little world, I was beginning to have a little bit of uh, compassion fatigue around pushing myself to be outside my own little world. Can I get a witness on that? Anybody else having a little... It's been a good series, but <clears throat> won't be terrible to move on to Advent and angels among us. So I started thinking about the fact that this title could sound a little bit like a pep rally for Jesus. Start living right now. So as some of you know, I can be somewhat of a curmudgeon and... Uh, feel like if somebody's pushing me in a direction to do something, I kind of naturally want to push back. Anybody else with me on that? So I started thinking about the way in which we can be connected. 
Um, and, and the power that we've been using of the image of the metaphor of the body, which is found in Paul's letters, you know, that the, the, each part of the body depends on the other and the foot is just as important as the head. Um, and then the gifts, we all have gifts that are very valuable to the whole body. But, you know, I came across this, the wisdom of, of uh, Chief Seattle. And uh, if you can read those words, read them with me. Humankind has not woven the web of life. We are but one thread within it. Whatever we do to the web, we do to ourselves. All things are bound together. All things connect. That's sort of an indigenous spirituality that says the same thing that Paul said hundreds of years ago using the metaphor of the human body. This is the web. So my curmudgeonly self said, what, why is it that it might be difficult to live right now? Uh, I didn't want to come out here and, as I said, have it sound like a pep rally for Jesus. So the reality is it's hard sometimes to live right now if you're tired or if you're anxious or if grief is a part of your life or fear. or chronic pain, or, worst of all, indifference. So in order to really get real about living right now, I think we have to ha actually confess how difficult it is so that we're not just smiling at each other and thinking this is so easy to get started living right now. It isn't. It, sisters and brothers so let's just name how challenging it can be and then maybe we can move on before we move on anybody have a thought of what else might be a stumbling block money any other stumbling block to living right now inaccessibility Anxiety, fear, yeah. So I want to reclaim some traditional words. Paul read from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. I've intentionally chosen another version because oftentimes when you look at another version, the the places where the Greek can be interpreted in multiple different ways, surfaces, and helps us realize we have a creative investment in understanding what this might mean for us today. So we are working together with God. We ask you from our hearts not to receive God's loving favor and then waste it. I kind of like that working together with God. Another place it's called... Um, co-creators. We are co-creators with God. Now, um, I would like those of you who are older than 55 to read that next section. Ready? The And if you're less than 55, read that section if you would. So I just have a hunch that some of you, if you're anything like I am, have struggled a little bit with this sin and salvation language. Because traditionally, those words have been used to make us feel like there is something inherently wrong and evil with us. 
that is a misunderstanding of what those basic theological words mean. Now, that's not to say if we do something egregious like go out and shoot somebody, that that isn't a sign of something that's really broken. But sin means more than that. It's sort of the condition in which we live. It's whatever separates us or keeps us so close that we can't even see outside our own little world. Like being overcommitted or being too anxious or, or, or being too preoccupied or thinking that all of, our respons- all of the responsibility of doing good in the world is just on us. Elijah at one point said, Woe is me, there's nobody else in the world who is as faithful as I am. Oh, come on, Elijah, get off it. Welcome to the human race. Sin is simply a description of why it is that when we say that we are followers of Jesus, and Jesus' primary command is to love one another as I have loved you, I'm guessing if you're anything like I am, you don't do that every day of the week and in every minute. Can I get some support on that? So it doesn't mean we're evil. It doesn't mean that we're supposed to be using all of our shadow, all everything that we fear and project it on some particular group of people. No, it just means hey, you know what? We have to acknowledge that we can't be loving all the time. And that's the mystery of the faith, is that yes, indeed, God continues to love us even when we can't do it in in all times and places. And my friends, that is what saves us. Oftentimes in the Christian tradition, being saved uh, is the equivalent of having the right formula to say. I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And if you say those words, somehow magically you will be in right relationship with God. Now, for some people that works. I know it because I've seen it. For me, a formula doesn't cut it. There has to be something about transformation. That's what being saved is. It's pulling us out of the places where we're stuck so that we actually can live outside of our own little world. And it's, unfortunately, confession has gotten a bad rap in Protestantism. We don't have the little booth that you go into and slide the thing across and talk to the priest. But confession, however you do it, can be profoundly liberating because it lets you be who you are, which is human, not perfect. Redeemed, not thrown in a wastebasket. Nobody is thrown in the wastebasket by God's perspective and understanding. I can't resist also sharing, especially about this. Notice notice the bookends of this text. We're working together with God. And down here is, uh, we're the house of the living God. That is both a terrific honor and a high calling and a challenge. But it bookends with we're working with God, God is dwelling among us. And I I don't have the picture because it just came to me how important this illustration is right now, but um, my wife posted on Facebook a sign from a Disciples of Christ Church in Texas that said, when Jesus was faced with a crowd of 5,000, he fed them. If you were with us last week, you heard an incredibly powerful story from Sarah Bradshay. She told about growing up in a tradition where she actually was told that because she was lesbian, she was evil and would not be in right relationship with God. I am so glad that she found this church. That is salvation today, sisters and brothers. When you can see a before I, 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 I had no place in the world, I, and all of a sudden, I belong, not only to God, but to this group of people. That's powerful. That saves people's lives. That literally, I don't necessarily mean they're going to rise up from the tomb, but we all know, don't we, times in our life when we've been breathing, but we're really dead. And we know people who are breathing and are really dead. 
Some of them are our friends and some of them, maybe not. But there is this thing about loving your enemies. Darn it. <laughs> Suzanne Dunn shared during her um, witnessing steward that Bethel had been kind of like the light for her. The light to be able to see that I could come home. I could find my faith again in this tradition. And um, that's another example of being saved. I don't mean in that traditional language. I mean in terms of finding new life again. <sighs> Isn't that terrific? Now, I want you to stop and think for a minute. And I really, this is not just a rhetorical question. I want you to think for a minute about someone from your perspective who has been saved or resurrected or transformed as a result of this community of faith. And your homework is to find a way to share with that person, if you came up with someone, that has been an inspiration for you. That's your spiritual homework. Because living right now means we actually believe, we have faith that we are the living temple. We have faith that even though we know ourselves well enough to know that we are no saint, that doesn't stop spirit from claiming and reclaiming and making new and revitalizing and re-energizing each and every one of us and as a community together. That's the good news, sisters and brothers. You're the good news. Look to someone beside you or near you. Maybe you want to turn around and just say, you're good news. You're good news. You're good news, friend. Cole, you're good news. Time to practice being uh, people who live, Paul used the word abundance, we, we, we do live in abundance. Unfortunately, our culture tells us there's scarcity all the time, but we do live in abundance, and now's the time to, uh, to gather our morning offering.